we're going to, if you can all see the agenda there, we've been collating that document of participant introduction since the beginning because um, there's some really useful info in there for uh, what we might want to attend to as things progress. So we want to keep that as a live document, uh, but we would like to restrict access just to the, me the members. And so we'll talk a little bit later about how we might be restricting access, but um, just to let you know that we will keep that going and we might ask people to add to that if they haven't already or if they want to keep that updated as they go. Uh, the previous notes, we've got a link there for people who um, would like to go over those. I don't think many notes were taken last time, but um, meanwhile too, we have meeting notes documents for today's meeting. Yeah, so uh, um, then, I might just add a couple of things there, Melly. Um, so in yeah. terms of the participant introductions, when we um, originally had that, it was, it was just private. Uh, so if you want to have a look through it and, and just check if there is anything that you do not want uh, in a public document, that would be good. Uh, if you don't have any objections, then that's fine. Thanks. Uh, the other one is in terms of uh, notes, it'd be, uh, I'd really like us to, to encourage everyone to uh, use that Google Sheet that um, Melanie's got and, and take notes as we go. So uh, we got that for, for us as, as well as those others who join us later on. Okay, uh, so what should we shift on to the number two then? Well, we yeah, probably we should introduce our two new chairs as well, Melanie. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, sorry, welcome new chairs. Oh, I zipped over that one. A uh, very big welcome to Adam, Sia, and to Andrew Whiting. Thanks so much for um, being interested in joining us, and we're really happy to have you along. Yeah. Uh, you're very welcome to say a few words. I um, guess I'll just say thanks, everyone. Um, I hope I can be a good co chair. So I sort of represent, I guess, the geospatial industry at large and um, the open source geospatial community in Oceania. So, um, yeah, thanks. And, and, and from me as well, thanks, Adam and Andrew, for um, agreeing to be part of CoJS. Um, makes it a lot easier for me, and, and you guys bring a lot of uh, experience, which will be, I think, great for the group. Okay, so uh, second agenda item was really just a, a quick note that uh, we've been drafting the terms of reference for this group. Uh, it's gone through a number of iterations. At the last meeting, we, we opened it up for comments because we did add a bit on, uh, adjust it a bit. Uh, there hasn't been all that many uh, comments since. So I just wanted to say that, that it's there if you want to have a look at it uh, and, and comment, but we might consider that to be the working in terms of reference for this group uh, for now. Melanie, do you want to take on to go on to agenda number three? Yep, sure. So we've been collating a document about requirements if we wanted to have some sort of an online space. So everyone's welcome to add more to that as we go as to what we might require. Um, meanwhile, we um, reminder that we have our AIBC community space. So we have our first discovery entry point to be able to discover this interest group uh, down in here. And then from this, currently we're linking to a Google document, but we wanted to say too that we just put together recently, uh, some people that within AIDC have putting to, been putting together Google sites for community practice. And so uh, we've got a few of us working on that sort of thing. So. Uh, I've just put this one together as an example of what we might have and um, because other people within ARDC are working on it, we can kind of troubleshoot if we're trying to do any specific things around access, etc. So currently it's public and it's general information. It is though within this Google domain, so that's potentially um, an access problem for people. So we just want to hear in general what people think about having this sort of site. Um, if we should continue or stop, 
and then within these community pages is the idea that we would have a space that is only accessible to people within our communities and so far the maybe easiest way to do that is to have this google group so no one's been invited yet it's just a party of one at the moment but if people want to continue with that then i will invite everyone and we can start to have some access because then it also means within this forum we can really start to have some conversations amongst ourselves uh, for things that we want to do. So maybe if just people let me know, maybe I'll just presume um, it's okay unless people say no <laughs> uh, or, or they have a preference for another sort of thing to do. We've talked in the past about Slack channels, etc. and um, people we'd be interested in people's experience with those and whether they'd want to proceed um, we just might grow and grow and I just want to be sure that doesn't matter how big we grow the channel will still be available to us we won't necessarily have to pay so I'd be really interested in hearing people's perspectives there too so this is Julia um, the Google site we hope to be a container for any outputs from this group that um, is agreed for, by the community to be valuable to other people. Um, potentially also this is where we will host a link to these recorded meetings. Um, and there is an event or a calendar associated with this site so we would be able to awareness raise any events associated with geospatial that you think might be valuable how how those um, events might be agreed to be put on and administration is yet to be determined but we're most interested in making sure that everybody could access this site from the outset and then as more and more of these sites grow with various communities as you would imagine there'd be a lot of overlap in information so then hopefully we can start to talk about where things ought to be stored or so um yep let me know via email or i um, mean until you're in the google group or whatever we want to do um yeah we're just really interested in hearing other people's perspectives so feel free to let me know anything you'd like to uh, and i'll collect that for everybody would anyone like to mention anything before we move on to presentations? Yeah, I guess I can put in two cents from the, the community I've been working with, and we have a pretty successful setup, I think, with um, running meeting agendas and outputs from the community in Google Docs. Um, we have a Slack channel and a couple of email lists that we use there. Um, they're just like regular mailman lists that are hosted for us by OSGO, but um, they work. So it's a bit of a, a mixed bag, but we haven't yet found a better way. So I, th I think, you know, heading to that, that same sort of pattern seems to be working well. Thank you. Hands up or anything? If um, more mention about that at the moment we can move on to the presentation. Mel did you want to talk so, about um, uh, the Slack channel or how we want to do that part? Mm, that's all I really had to say about the Slack channel was I just didn't have much experience with it and if people found it uh, useful and Boundless, then we could go for that, but only if it gave things that the Google group didn't give. Um. Okay. Uh, if you have any, if anyone's got any thoughts on, on that kind of um, offline chat uh, needs, then do let us know and, and we'll see what we can organize for that. Okay, we're running on good time, so Adam. So we got a couple of presentations and the first one's from Adam on the voice geo Oceania community, which I think is a very interesting uh, one to hear. Adam, did you want to take over? All right. Um, 
So I'm assuming everyone can see the big map on the screen. So that's that's good. Um, so I have 15 minutes to tell you about OSGO Oceania, which is um, an organization that's been set up to support a regional open geospatial community. And I, I had a look through the people attending and I, I think I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here because there's lots of people who already know about this stuff. So I hope you all learn something new and everyone else learns something new as well. Um, so, oh, come on, there we go. Just by way of introduction, um, I run a little company at the moment and I do lots of things in it. Um, basically spend my time doing geospatial analysis for people using open source tooling. I'm also a, a board member of OSGO Oceania and that's the capacity I am speaking in today. So, um, and we, we aim to represent basically the entire Oceania community, not just us. So we've got a few different ways of saying hi at the top. Um, so, OSGO Oceania is about supporting and promoting free and open source software for geospatial. So there's a bunch of icons here from various projects which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, the next talk up should focus on, on this one, um, Proj, which actually supports dynamic datums. It's an open source geodetic transformation toolkit. So um, Nick, if you're already here, that's this one for you to talk about if you want to. Um, but all the other ones, so GeoNode, I know a bunch of people use for cataloging data. QGIS is a desktop um, geospatial analysis system. Um, open layers, leaflet and map server all deliver maps to the web. The Open Data Cube is a big deal in Australia. We, we've got some significant government infrastructure running on it, running on, on that open source toolkit, um, which in itself in turn depends on PostGIS as a database and um, geospatial analytics toolkit and GDAL, the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library, um, which is a very large and diverse toolkit for operating on raster data. So it's, um, it's almost like black magic once you get started playing with it and it's a lot of fun. But um, that's basically what it is. And it's, it's it, all of these projects, um, you can just go and download them off the web and start using them. There's no license fee, there's no, um, you don't have to pay anyone a maintenance fee or anything like that. You, you can just go and take them. Um, it doesn't mean that making things with Geos, with open source toolkits is always free. You still need to pay people and you will probably still need to pay people for support, just like you do with any other software. But we really like that you can just take these things and modify them, inspect them, reuse them, recycle them and do what you like. Um, so, this is um, predominantly a government research community that's here in the um, ARDC. So why would you use open source software in government and research? Um, the first reason I can think of is if there's, is there's no licensing fees, you're not sort of stuck to paying out a bunch of money every year and you don't have to hire a license manager, which is a big deal for me. I, I've gone through that wrangling a lot and I don't like it. Um, it's secure. So if you're building critical infrastructure, you can have your, your security experts and penetration testers assess every single line of code and see where the bugs are and fix them if they want. Um, it's repeatable. If I, this is what I do a lot for business, I build stuff for people and I give it all to them. They don't have to come back to me later and go, oh, I, I couldn't do the thing you did because I don't have the software. So they will, here is all the stuff. If I write um, statistical tools, they can examine every part of it and go, well, yeah, we can reproduce everything there if we're given tests. Um, whoops, sorry, I'll go back one. It's supported. So there is, for all of these tools, a global community working on them. So that means that it, it's not sort of one or two people in a company burning down some little rabbit holes, fixing things means that a lot of people with many different viewpoints are working together collaboratively to, to address problems or make new features or do things that, that mean things to a really broad audience. So um, those are 
reasons I can think of that, that governments and researchers should um, support this community and, and start working with these tools. So I, I'm sure you can think of lots of others. Um, and there really is a global community. So globally, there's the, the Open Source Geospatial Foundation, um, which has been running for uh, since 2006, I believe, um, which has a global conference every year called FOS4G. Um, and we've just basically set up a regional chapter of that here to support the local um, local community because going to international conferences from Australia is quite hard. It costs a lot of money. It's really hard to get to. So we thought, well, let's let's bring it here, and that's what we've been up to. So, and there's also the Open Street Map Foundation, which supports a really huge open mapping data project called Open Street Map, which we use a lot for for things like navigation or, or just um, curiosity and seeing where things are or even network analysis and stuff like that. So, And that has a national conference every uh, a global conference, state of the map every year. Um, again, that's not always easy to get to. And finally, the Open Spatial, Geospatial Consortium works with both of these groups looking at standards and how to pass data around. Um, and the local community. So we discovered, and I, I think quite a few of you already know this, that there's quite an active regional and local community in Oceania using open source tooling. Um, there's meetups, mapathons, all of the things here, universities that have departments using and developing open source stuff, um, government departments that rely on it, and people just getting stuff done. So QGIS in particular, there's a really strong local development community here. A couple of the core developers live in Queensland and are responsible for a lot of stuff that happens in that software package. Um, I'll move on from there. So I think we sort of, in 2017, a bunch of people got together and thought, well, we want to build a, we want to support the community here. And um, a year later, a conference popped up. So it was the first, um, joint Phos4G and State of the Map conference held in Oceania. Um, we thought, oh, we'll get about 40 people and we'll get a bit of money and we might make it break even. And we partnered up with Triple SSI for um, their underwriters. Um, we sold the conference out uh, long before we actually opened the doors. We generated a heap of sponsorship. And people came from all over the world. So. It was based in Melbourne and most people did come from the Eastern seaboard of Australia, but we had people from the Pacific Islands and Europe and America, the US and Hong Kong and Japan turn up to the conference. So it generated quite a lot of excitement and we thought, well, we, we're probably like a long way too late for this. There's quite a big, exciting community here. Um, 2009, we held another event in Wellington. Um, that was also sold out before the event took place and again drew quite a large audience from from many different parts of the world and some of those were were a lot of those were people that just turned up and wanted to come some of them we specifically called out for the conference so we ran a travel grant program every year so we could get people from um, far away or Pacific Islands specifically or remote communities in Australia, or basically people who are, who are not well represented in the, the community to, to turn up and come to the conference. So um, that's been quite successful. Um, and in 2019, was it 19? Late, yeah, 2019, we minted an organization. So OSDO Oceania um, exists now as a not-for-profit, company limited by guarantee uh, it's uh, governed by a board of directors that are all volunteers and it's basically dedicated to supporting this community as as, as much as we can so running the conference series providing um, infrastructure for communications and talking about stuff and basically community building projects and we've this year already sponsored a bunch of um, small-scale mapping events mostly in Melbourne actually we're looking at um running a QGIS developers, developers event in Queensland. And we're, we're supporting a bunch of other small initiatives. One of them is 
a tree planting event for uh, greenhouse gas mitigation for the 2019 conference. So we're basically doing a canopy coverage restoration project in Melbourne. So we, we do a lot of stuff for a small band of volunteers. And um, going back away to the slide, I, I, the slide series about why this community matters for researchers in government, we'd like you to get involved as well. So um, this slide full of words is links to different um, information resources. So um, the top link is just about us, of the Oceania community. We don't have a proper website. So while we've been busy doing all this other stuff, we haven't got our act together to go, well, we kind of need a website and, and some formal methods. Um, the global OSGO, website uh sorry going back one two yeah how to get started in osgo and then some resources for open street map as well so it can be a little bit bewildering so people that are new to the community sort of hit all these this wall of information and go well, okay that's, that's great but um how do i actually get started and that's um what the next slide is all about, you can talk to us. So um, we've got a bunch of email lists that are just for general discussion. And you can ask any kind of question. It doesn't have to be a technical question or about how to do some sort of rigorous transformation in C++. You can just say, hey, I'm confused. How do I get started? Who is there to help me out? So they're, we're generally a friendly bunch. And if there are people who are unfriendly, we, we remind them that we're meant to be friendly fairly often. So um, I should have mentioned that actually, we do operate under a, a code of conduct. So that's, that was a key part of our organization. We have a, a strong and enforced code of conduct that basically says, be nice to people because it's just worth doing that. Um, and the other way to get involved if you feel like you really want to is to become a member of the organization. So because we have a formal um, company limited by guarantee now, you can become a member. Um, membership doesn't cost you anything. And the, the most onerous duty of a member is to vote on board elections. So every, every year we'll have a board election and basically the only requirement of membership is to vote in that. Um, and if you want to help shape the organization, you need to be a member in order to be nominated to be a director. So, um, yeah, that's basically, we'd like you to be, we'd like lots more people to become members because we want a big and diverse bunch of voices that join in and, and help shape the organization. Um, and we're right now just working through ways to, to get more members on board. So keep an eye on our OSGO discussion list and Twitter and um, there'll be more updates on that soon. And in 2020, we are running another conference. This time it's in Suva in Fiji, which is a little island just to the, um, the right and below the, the uh, excl exclamation mark there. So there's a basically locally led conference organizing committee. Most of the, the people there are from Fiji and working on a on their own iteration of the conference. So there's a bit of information coming out about that now, but that will ramp up soon and there'll be a proper website and um, information on how to sponsor the conference, go along to the conference and help out with the local organizing committee soon. And that is the end of my bit of stuff I had to say. So if you have any questions or if there's time left for questions, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you, Adam. That was really useful. Um, is we have a few minutes for questions. So, is there any questions for Adam? Um, I just noticed there's a few in chat. I'll address those as we go on. But um, if no one has, yeah, feel free to chat direct or, or um, even email me directly, um, privately or to the group. It doesn't matter, and I will respond to those as we progress through the rest of the meeting. Adam, um, there's one question on the chat. Um, how do you join? How do we join? Um, at the moment, we don't. 
we we had our first member membership intake in November last year, and at that point we were going to make a call for members and have people nominated every three months or so. But we've just um, upset our entire model and decided that we're going to just um, continually take membership applications. So you, you can just there will be a way soon where you can just go to a, probably a Google form, put in your details, and then there's a membership working group that just has to tick a bunch of boxes and and then that's it. So we'll have more information coming out about that soon. And um, I'd be very happy to send this presentation to everybody here so they can grab the links and um, find their mailing list and everything else that they need to. So um, when we have the membership system formalized and ready to go, we will communicate that via Twitter and the discussion email list and in our um, Map Time Australia Slack channels. So I think ideally before March, we'll have that sorted out and be ready to, to start um, taking members again. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, if you could send that to Melanie, then we can get it up on that website. Um, also, just Adam, I just noticed in, in that uh, the 2020 conference, was the dates correct? It's in November 2020? Yes. All right. Um, it said November 2019, so I wasn't sure. Oh, whoops. Sorry, it's, it's November 2020. <laughs> so it's Sorry, 17th to 20th November 2020 is when that is. Yeah. So I'm interested. Yep. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Adam. Um, no worries, Kim. All right. We might move on to our second presentation, which is from Nick Brown on the GDA 2020. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Uh, some of you I know, um, some of you I don't. So thanks to Melanie and, and Andrew Whiting for uh, offering me the opportunity to, to come along today. Um, we've only got a, a f about 15 minutes. So what I wanted to do was sort of take you through quite a high level overview of um, changes that are being made and upgrades to the Australian Geospatial Reference System. Um, I'm the Director of National Geodesy at Geoscience Australia and I'm also uh, Chair of the Permanent Committee on Geodesy, which is part of an organisation called uh, ICSM, some of you may have heard of. So they're sort of the people from um, spatial and surveying sector around, around Australia and New Zealand and we get together a few times a year and, and do a lot of work together given that spatial doesn't have uh, boundaries. So, well, we don't want them to have boundaries, that's for sure. Um, so just to give you a bit of an overview as to what, what was the main reason we were looking at, at up, upgrading components of the reference system in Australia. Um, the reality is it's because uh, geodesy, positioning, spatial, um, they're no longer esoteric sciences, they're really mainstream. And we were looking at the, the growth markets in GNSS chipset sales um, and we noticed that the sort of traditional markets that we looked at uh, at using GNSS and being involved in, in spatial and surveying were going to only make up about 10% of where all chipset sales. That's the, that's the hardware that allows you to position yourself. They're all going to end up in things like driverless cars and, and mobile phones over the next 10 years. So we needed to make sure that uh, these new and emerging uh, user bases could actually position themselves accurately and align their spatial data very accurately. So to do that, we thought, well, we need to try and address what the users are going to want. Um, and a big part of that was, um, as I mentioned, this new and emerging um, user base. Um, to go with that, we're actually gonna have the technology in Australia within a few years time, um, thanks to the Positioning Australia program. It's a $225 million program that's gonna be providing a, a at least 10 centimetre accurate positioning to everybody uh, in their mobile devices and probably the devices you're already using now once it's switched on. So this gives you a bit of an idea of how it all fits together. You can have the satellites sending data down to our GNSS stations on the ground. From that we produce uh, corrections and, and services that can either be delivered via the internet to all these user groups or if you're in an area where you haven't got mobile phone coverage and, and you can't get it over the internet, uh, there'll be a, a, what we call a, a correction service which will be delivered to, from space. So you'll always be able to get that 10 centimetre accurate positioning um, throughout Australia and the maritime jurisdiction. So There's a bit of a game changer in terms of positional accuracy that we've had in Australia. 
So to, to make sure people could capitalize on that, we've gone through and refreshed and upgraded the reference system for Australia. And if you have a look at the bottom, you'll see the maybe the datums you're traditionally used to working with, which were around the geocentric datum of Australia in 1994. Um, and then up towards the top, um, we show GDA 2020, which is our new uh, static reference system for Australia. And we've developed the transformation grids and services to allow you to get between them. And then as you look to the left, uh, you can see that if you don't want to work in a static reference frame, you can actually work in a kinematic one where the coordinates of features will change with time. Um, and that's called the Australian Terrestrial Reference Frame uh, 2014. And it's referred to 2014 because it's, ex it's very, very closely aligned with ITRF. You'll, you'll effectively get the same solution. Um, and they're linked by this plate motion model. And I'll, I'll describe a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, on the right hand side, you can see that we're, we've also introduced um, a, a new vertical working surface. So some of you would be used to using AHD or Ausgeoid models to get to AHD. Um, the Ausgeoid model has a gravity component, and gravimetric component, and also a geometric component. And uh, the geometric component takes the gravity model and then deals with some of the bias and distortion associated with AHD and, and the leveling that was done to create AHD. We sort of strip all that away and, and we just work purely off the gravity model. And that's really what AVWS is. So what was the main driver for moving away from GDA 94, for example, a lot, a lot of people were suggesting, well, to avoid any confusion, couldn't we just, um, can't we deal with the fact that we're lucky and we've got this Australian plate that's moving seven centimetres a year, it's largely in the same direction, can't we just deal with that sort of 1.5 to 1.8 metre offset and, and uh, provide a really simple model to allow people to align themselves with GNSS? Because um, otherwise they're going to notice that 1.8 metre offset. Um, the reality is that that's only one part of the story. There's also this distortion component. So if you zoom into these areas of New South Wales and you compare a, uh, a GPS position that you get today uh, relative to um, the, the position that you would have got in, um, let, me, let me try and explain this another way. If you go out to a survey mark today and you look at the GDA 94 coordinate, um, and then you take out the plate motion, which is that 1.8 metres across Australia, um, you still end up with these, these distortions that you see on the right hand side. And they're largely due to the way that GDA 94 was developed. Um, we didn't propagate all the uncertainty through the mathematical solution. So you end up with these strange distortions in the network. So even if you account for the plate motion, you still get left with this distortion of about half a metre in some areas. So users would still see that half a metre if they were trying to position themselves today uh, with GPS and we accounted for the plate motion. So we needed something to, to clean it up and provide a, a better, more accurate uh, datum for Australia because if you're getting 10 centimetres in your mobile phone and you're getting half a metre distortions in your datum, the positioning service you're providing is, is pretty useless. So we don't need to get into the, the technicalities of the legal system, but as you can see up in the top left, um, what we actually did was change the, what we call the recognised value standard of measurement of position. So this redefined what uh, the datum was in Australia. And we have a lot of earth centred coordinates. Um, importantly here, you can see that we actually gazetted the coordinate uncertainties and the velocities and the velocity uncertainties when we went to uh, the government and said, we want to change what the datum is. So what this actually allows us to do is say that GDA 2020 can be used as the static datum um, and, and it's legal. Uh, we can also say that if you want to work in a time dependent reference frame, you can work in ATRF because we have um, got in, in here in the determination what the velocities are. So you can map um, coordinates back and forward through time. And so both of those um, datums are actually legally traceable um, as of now. Um, I'll now touch on, uh, th so this is, gives you a sort of an indication of, you know, who we think are going to be these new and emerging users of precise positioning. Um, you think about people who uh, are going to want to 
take advantage of three to 10 centimeter accurate positioning, uh, they're gonna wanna operate in a time dependent reference frame because they're getting coordinates from, from GNSS in a time dependent reference frame and they needed a reference frame that was gonna support them. So that's really what ATRF 2014 is, is designed to do. So here's, a, here's an example of um, maybe one of you trying to break your Strava record, um, riding on your bike. You're actually getting your information in things like Strava and location-based apps in uh, ITRF. And ATRF can be considered to be almost identical to that. Um, the main reason that we introduced ATRF instead of just using ITRF as it is, is, ar is around that legal determination. We could always go back and be able to legally define what an ATRF coordinate is, because it's based off a denser set of data uh, within Australia. That's really the only difference between ATRF and ITRF. And here's, a, here's uh, the, the um, example of the plate motion model. So if you're trying to propagate from GDA 2020 to ATRF 2014, we've actually published what these values are. It's, a, it's what you'd normally use for a 14 parameter transformation, but it's only got three numbers in it. And it just deals with the rotation of the Australian plate. So we're very lucky in Australia that we don't have to deal with the, some of the bigger distortion and deformation um, grids that they do in places like New Zealand. Um, but we are looking into how we could potentially um, bring things like deformation grids into it into the future. So here's just a bit of a diagram that, it, that sort of explains that. You can see down the bottom, GDA 2020. And with time, uh, you'll see that the, uh, there's no change in the Y axis. So there's no change in position. Whereas with ATRF coordinates, they're gonna move with the Australian plate of, at about seven centimeters a year. Uh, finally, the, th the thing that I wanted to briefly introduce you to um, was the new vertical working surface, the Australian vertical working surface. And this, the reason that we've released this new vertical working surface is in recognition of the fact that users are going to have that 10 centimeter accurate positioning capability in their hands. Um, but we needed a datum that was going to be better than the quality they were getting from their GNSS. Your, you can't make decisions about something if your datum is not accurate enough. And as I'll show you in, in a couple of slides, the Australian height datum we've been using, uh, to interact with that with GNSS, you, used, you need to use the Ausgeoid model. And the Ausgeoid model has uncertainties that blow out to up to about 13 centimetres in different areas. So that means when you're trying to, when you're trying to work with uh, a physical height datum, um, it's very limiting for things like irrigation, major road development, um, we've had plenty of examples where people can't um, or they've had to go back and retrofit roads because the way that they were developed, they were trying to fit everything to AHD and water is actually flowing in the wrong direction. So they're getting a lot of problems and having to rebuild roads. It's costing millions of dollars and um, it's largely based around poor quality AHD coordinates. So we're, we're currently using the Australian height datum throughout most of Australia, but it's, it's, you know, it's almost a, it's a 50 year old datum. Um, it was based off tide gauges around the Australian mainland and, and Tassie, which was done a bit later on. And then they leveled from those tide gauges after setting them at zero, leveled inland and then tried to work out how to do an adjustment where you're trying to fit all this data together. Uh, the reality is it's, it's very good over areas of about less than 10 kilometres, which is great for applications like cadastral surveying, um, but it's not so great for people who are doing things like large scale LIDAR projects, um, where they can't tell anymore is, um, as I say down the bottom here, is the error in the data or is it my datum? We actually did a user requirement study and that was a common thing that we heard back. When I'm working over large areas, I can't tell if these jumps and distortions in, in the data set I'm looking at are actually caused by the data or, in, or the datum. Um, so here's a, here's a bit of an uncertainty map that shows you where, it, where it's good and, and bad throughout Australia. If you're using uh, GNSS to convert to HD, you're looking at about eight to 13 centimetres in terms of accuracy, which um, good for some, not so good for others. So what we have done is um, tried to provide a, a, the vertical working surface, which is gonna better suit um, some people who are doing large scale LIDAR, remote sensing type work, environmental monitoring, um, we're in discussions at the moment about potentially using this as the datum for things like the Snowy Hydro project, which is working over a very large area. 
um, or for water monitoring and modelling throughout things like uh, Barwon Water or the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, importantly, it, it also works seamlessly onshore and offshore, which is something that we haven't traditionally had. Um, so we're working closely with the um, hydrographic office as well about the potential for, for them to be using this in some of their modelling. This gives you an indication of the, the difference in the, the quality or the accuracy of what you'd get if you're working uh, from ellipsoidal heights to AHD using Osgeo 2020, you're looking at eight to 13 centimetres. But as soon as you strip out some of that bias and distortion associated with uh, Osgeoid and you just use the gravimetric component from the Australian vertical working surface, you can see that it brings down um, the uncertainty down to about one to eight centimetres. And we're doing some airborne gravity surveys. You might see some hot spots there over Victoria, for example. Um, we're going to do some airborne gravity using state government funding over the next 12 months. And we've, uh, our simulations show that we'll get down to about one to two centimetres of accuracy, um, which is phenomenal and, and really open up a whole range of new applications when it's combined with um, precise positioning from the Positioning Australia program. Um, this is, a, this is just a useful diagram I like to have in slides to, so people can come back to and reflect on it. Um, it just shows here that when you use Ausgeoid and when, and when you use AVWS, what you're actually referring to. Um, and also to note the, the height difference between GDA 94 and GDA 2020 coordinates uh, means that you need to use the model to fit the right datum. Um, the difference in the in the two height systems there of, of um, sorry in the two datums in terms of height is actually because we've got an improved realization of the shape of the Earth. So we used ITRF 1992 when we defined GDA 94, and with um, GDA 2020 we used ITRF 2020, and that, that it actually changed the the size and shape of the reference frame that we use, which causes a nine centimetre change in height. So something to be conscious of when you when you're comparing data sets. Uh, the last thing I wanted to, to touch on um, was just the work that we're trying to do uh, with the EPSG and standards community to make sure that they can access and use a lot of these changes. Um, this just gives you an indication of the things that have gone in to date. Um, and we're also still undertaking some work with them on, in discussions on things like WG34 uh, to try and alleviate some confusion about that. It's very much treated as a static uh, datum in standards, um, but there needs to be growing recognition that it's actually a dynamic datum and it's, it's moving uh, much in the same way that ITRF is. So I'm very, very, very conscious that I've just thrown a heck of a lot of information to you in a very short amount of time, um, but I would point you to the top link, um, icsm.gov.au. Um, I did a series of four webinars which covered all of that across about three hours um, last year. And so there's four webinars that break all those bits um, down and provide a lot more information and context. Um, so feel free to go and have a look at that link and, and those um, webinars. They're all still up and free and available. Uh, the PowerPoints are there as well. If you want to use it, please feel free. Um, and my contact details are there. I'm more than happy to help out with people who are going through this transition or to explain things in, in more detail. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Nick. That was um, very useful and interesting to see all the work that's happening there. Um, is there any questions for um, Nick? Nick, can you share that slide with the um, different datums and the effects? Or is this the one you're talking about, Simon? Uh, no, the diagram with uh, that one, yeah. That one, yep. Or, no. or are you sharing the whole presentation with the, um, with the attendees here? I can, yeah. So I can circulate it to the mailing list if you want. Yes, do please. We, mm -hmm. Do oh, we have a, a yeah, site um, where we can dump documents, um, Kieran? Yeah, I think we'll be getting it on that Google site Melanie was talking about. Nick, if you can yeah. send it to Melanie, then we can organise that to go up there. I wanted to add there too. So meanwhile, in the IPSM uh, metadata working group, uh, there's work in parallel to talk about the metadata side of this as well. So, um, but if there's anyone here who'd like to mention more about that, go ahead. Byron, for example. 
I'm sorry, Melanie, I couldn't quite hear you, but you're asking for some uh, input on what's happening on the metadata front. Um, it was about this um, particular datum and the work that we, the discussion began in our last face to face, but I haven't been very close to it. Yes, so the, uh, the, the metadata standard has 115-3, uh, 19115-3 is in the process of being updated to support the issues of the dynamic data and the changing values there. So what is needed is a, a date on the data that indicates at what point uh, the, say the GPS values were captured, uh, you know, or whatever the, the reference frame that you're capturing the information to when it was captured so that when you put it against the historical data, uh, you can you can do the proper adjustments because the GPS values are continually adjusting. They aren't static, of course, uh, as the plates move. So we've modified it a bit, uh, kind of a minimal approach to get what will will capture the information going forward. Uh, the process is going through ISO uh, TC211 to get that approved. Uh, and it, I think it's going pretty, pretty smoothly. Um, I have some minor concerns with it, but it works and probably as good as we can get. The main concerns I have are that it's slightly different than the, than the ISO 19111, which is all about these, uh, the, the geodesy and datums and such going on and how you define them. That's where these dynamic datums were first defined and so there's some slight differences between how it's captured and how you how you how you would actually use the stuff is going to be the next step so I guess is, is really the problem because what's happened in 115 is kind of a, a mixture between uh, the old 115 and uh, 111 so uh, yeah there's some issues we'll have to get through but it's kind of just teething problem at least we'll be able to capture the datums uh, uh, the epochs for the datums and be able to make sure our stuff will align as, as well as possible. Yeah, Byron, I got an email from, um, from Joel Hasdyke and from Roger, I think at Roger Lott yesterday, and I think they're now pushing to take the wording from 111, as you, as you mentioned, and using that in 115. So I think everyone's on board with that now. So that'd be good. Yeah, yeah, it's getting close. There's just some kind of issues. One of the issues related to that is that the dependencies reference uh, 111 and not 115, and you know, some which is kind of confusing when you're actually okay. implementing right, gotcha. the model. But that's what can you do sort of issue about it. Uh, they are pulling over the parts that allow you to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's still some legacy issues on it, but that's going to happen regardless. Um, yeah, uh, it's really a matter of coming up with uh, the, the best practices going forward. Thank Thanks, you, Pat. So we can keep the, the group informed with updates. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, uh, well, thank you. Um, oh, Kieran? No, so, thank you, Nick, again. Uh, and, and Madam, um, we might move on to the next last agenda item, I guess. Uh, in there. So Melanie, did you mm -hmm. want to yep, run where, um, the last bit? Sure thing. So we're keeping track within that link there. Um, we're keeping track of presentations, discussions, etc. So that um, and we'll put that up on the website too, so that we can keep um, the presentation slides available for people to look back at uh, in the future but also we have the recordings too. Uh, so this is our central place for keeping track too of things that we want to have in the future and everyone's welcome to add to that. Uh, the next item was, um, so uh, Kieran, would you like to talk for the RDA plenary, uh, 18th to 20th of March? I'm not gonna be there, but um, maybe someone who's gonna be there would like to talk about whether there's potential for a face-to-face Melanie, you're fading in, in the audio a bit. 
Um, but I think you're talking about the, uh, the next meeting. Um, so the, um, the C3, DIS and RDA uh, conferences are happening in uh, March, uh, 18th March to the 20th that, that week. I just wanted to pose to the group whether they, we wanted to organize a face-to-face -face sort of meeting because there might be a, a number of us in Melbourne uh, at the same time. So um, given that we've got a large number of people here, um, if you want to uh, just put your thoughts on, on, the, on the meeting notes, uh, that'll work, but uh, just a quick, very quickly, you know, is that something that people would like to see to, to have a face-to-face -face or try and organize something? I think it could be valuable. And one of the things that we did at eResearch, which seemed to be a bit of a pop-up, was just to say, hey, we're going to be here at, at the Oran um, site. And if people want to come along, and I think we did it at a lunchtime and it was quite valuable got some good input so that might be an approach rather than trying to formally coordinate something you mean the Oren booth do you the Oren booth yeah at a research I don't, I'm not sure if Oren's having a booth at um, research data um, research data Alliance but we'll find somewhere yeah that sounds like a good idea um, if there are any other thoughts, you know, let, let me know or Melanie know, or you can put it up on the on the meeting notes and, and we'll start to look at that. Um, but uh, um, I think that's that's the main bits for the agenda. Is there anything else anybody wants to mention quickly we got them before we wrap up? Just to please um, input into that document anything that you would like to either hear or present. Um, or even any events that you're aware of that are attending are coming up this year that we can circulate to the broader group. I will email an invitation to everyone to join the Google group and uh, then I can start to put some comments in there too and then if you add comments there about things that you might want then we can end up putting them in the spreadsheet etc as well too because I really a few documents around and uh, we'll help you with that too. All right, um, look, thank you everybody. It's uh, spot on time. Uh, I hope it was a useful session for everyone um, and uh, look forward to meeting you guys at the next one. Right. And if you've got any comments, thoughts, feel free to email me or Melanie or any of the other chairs. All right, thank you all, bye. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.